I hope you're encouraged by that. And man, this, this last song really speaks to us, doesn't it? Uh, come on, let's face it. Uh, we, we, we all face the heat sometimes, huh? Face the battle. You know, face the fire. And I think it's so important to be aware of this fact. In fact, uh, that song kind of summarizes the message of today. You know, um, going through the fire, all the waters, you are not alone if you're a follower of Christ. You are not alone. And then you can say from your heart, you know, I'll count the joy. Come every battle because I know that's where you will be. Jesus will be with you in every battle. Be aware of that. We need to, to understand that. Amen. There's another in the fire. So today we continue with our series, Walking in the Fire, okay, based on Daniel chapter 3, on the story of those three men who had to literally face the fire, literally walk in the fire. For most of us, when we talk about walking in the fire, it's a figure of speech. We're going through a tough time, a hard time in, in many different ways. And right now, many of our people are going through a tough time in different ways, illness, disease, and so forth. But we need to keep on praying and trusting God for a breakthrough, and we shall be doing this today as well. But we continue today in our series. Today is part two, Face the Heat. Face the Heat. And in this part, in this message, we will learn what those three men had that made them risk their lives, put their lives on a line, risk being burned, literally, rather than bowing to the image that the king had made. I mean, after all, what's the big deal, guys? There's an image, quick bow, and life goes on. What made those guys risk their lives because of that. And of course, after the message, we shall be taking communion together. So those of you online, get your bread and your juice ready to join us after the message. Our scripture is Daniel chapter 3. Last Sunday, I asked you to uh, read through chapter 3. I want, I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up, okay? Uh, we're in church, and I don't want to force anybody to lie in church, you know. But anyway, uh, I, I wonder how many of you read chapter 3. In fact, I wonder how many of you went back and read chapter 2, and maybe went forward and read chapter 4. I, I'll tell you why, guys, because it's always very important to read what's before and after whatever it is that we are studying in the Bible. When, you, when, when a particular verse speaks to you, Go and read the verses before and the verses after. It brings everything into context. When you are studying a particular chapter, go and read the chapter before and the chapter after because it puts everything into context. And chapter 2 kind of puts us in the context of this story. In chapter 2, Daniel interprets a dream for King Nebo. Now, the king wanted an interpretation for a dream that was bugging him. He had this recurring dream and these recurring visions in his room, and he wanted an interpretation because it was really bugging him. And so he called all the, all the wise men of his kingdom and, and, and the magicians and all the, you know, those guys. You know, because remember, this is in Babylon. They, they believe in spooky stuff, okay? They believe in stars and spirits and all that kind of stuff. And so he calls all these guys together and tells them, guys, I've had a dream. Give me the interpretation. Simple request, right? So the guy says, for sure, king, we'll gladly do it. Just tell us your dream. King says, no way, I'm not going to tell you my dream. Now, remember, King Nebo, he had been conquering lands. And every time he conquered a country, he would bring people from those countries to serve in his court. Remember Daniel, when they took the uh, Israelites captive, Daniel and a couple of young men were brought into his court, and they were trained in the ways of Babylon to serve the king. And so every nation that the kings conquered, they would bring into his kingdom and train them to serve him. Now the king says, okay, I've had a dream. If I tell you the dream, some of you oaks, okay, who are maybe prisoners, I captured you guys, you're going to use my dream to speak against me. So I'm not going to tell you my dream. If you're as powerful as you think, if your gods and your powers, if, you, if all that is really true, you're going to tell me my dream and the interpretation. And if you don't, I'm going to kill you. Simple. 
Now, th- th- this, this guy, listen, this guy was a bit of a lunatic. King Nebo was a bit of a lunatic. I mean, you read about it. He, he just wanted to kill and destroy. So the magicians and the wise men, they must tell him the interpretation. Otherwise, they get killed. And after a while, of course, this guy said, but king, it is impossible. No, no one can do this. He says, well, then goodbye. And he started killing these wise people of Babylon. So Daniel interfered, and he says, King, gave a message to the king. King, stop. Stop killing the people. I will talk to my God. My God will reveal your dream and the interpretation. So the king stopped killing the people, and he waited. And Daniel went before the Lord, and God revealed to Daniel the king's dream and the interpretation. And so Daniel came to the king, and he told him the dream, and he told him the interpretation. And you know, it's that that very, <clears throat> excuse me, that very famous dream of the great image with the head of gold and the chest of silver, you know, the, the belly of, of uh, copper and of bronze, you know, and then the legs of iron and the feet of a mixture of iron and the clay. Remember, it is a, a prophetic picture of the Gentile kingdoms that were to come, starting with Nebuchadnezzar. He was the head of gold, the, the mightiest kingdom in the world at that time, and then there would come all these other kingdoms until finally the whole thing would would collapse. And and by the way, when you look back in history, you find that that vision literally happened, and it is still happening because we today, we are still living in the residue of the Roman kingdom. The Roman kingdom today is dispersed, but it's not dead, okay? Okay. It's going to rise again, by the way, prophetically. And anyway, so that, that came to pass. But the fact is, Daniel came and he revealed to the king his dream and the interpretation. And, of course, all the other wise men were saved. And they were very grateful to Daniel for that, of course. But the fact is, that situation caused the king to, to take notice of Daniel. Look at this, Daniel chapter 2, verse 47. Daniel 2, 47. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. So now he acknowledges the God of Daniel as the God of gods, okay? Now, remember, he's a pagan man. He believes in all these gods. But now you realize that the God of David is the God above all gods. Doesn't change him completely, but it brings his attention to this being now. And he also promoted Daniel, and upon Daniel's request, his three friends. All right? A little lesson of here. If you get some favor in your life, try and bring some friends along with you, okay? <laughs> Just don't abuse. Just don't abuse it, okay, like some people are doing these days. Daniel chapter 2. Verses 48 to 49. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts. Now check this. And he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. So David shot up to be a very, very important man. And chief, now watch this, and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Babylon. In chapter 4, it talks, him about, it, it, it talks about him being chief amongst the seers or amongst the magicians. So all those people from the different nations that were soothsayers, magicians, and read the stars, astrologers, that whole clan, uh, guess who's in charge of them? Daniel. <laughs> Daniel has to meet, meet with this bunch of pagans all right, and get their reports and try and make some sense of this and and talk to the king. So he's he's a a big shot. He's an administrator in Babylon, in the whole province, plus he's in charge of all these wise men. And then, verse 49, Daniel petitioned the king, and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. In other words, Daniel was king's right-hand man. These are the guys who were were, were rulers in the province. They were given sections and so on to rule. But Daniel was like over everything, which, by the way, might explain why in chapter 3, the three men get accused, but not Daniel. 
There is some speculation about this. Two possibilities. Number one, because Daniel sat by the king it was close to the king and was so important, nobody did challenge Daniel. Nobody there accused Daniel. Okay? Number two, <clears throat> because Daniel was so important, it could be that at the time that this image was inaugurated, Daniel was away on business for the king. And so he was not in the place in Babylon, in the capital, when uh, this thing took place. Because he was not accused by the other three Jewish men, they were. They were the only four Jewish wise men in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. All right? So this gives us some background to chapter 3. And scholars tell us that between chapter 2 and chapter 3, 18 to 20 years have passed. And so it gave Nebo plenty of time to, to think up this image and have it built. And remember, in the dream that Daniel interpreted, he was the head of gold, the greatest kingdom, all right? And so he kind of created this image to symbolize that. It was not an image of himself. It was not an image of the king. It was just an image. And like I shared with you last week, it was really weird proportions. It was 10 times as high as it was wide. So it could be something else, something symbolic, you know. But he gave him time to prepare this image and to get everybody in there. And of course, by this time, the three men, the, the three Jewish boys, they are ruling the province and so on. And he, they are being treated like every other ruler of a province. Now, as we saw last week, the king made that image of gold and called everybody in authority in his kingdom to, for the inauguration. These three men were there as well. And we learned last week that this is a picture of what many believers have to face today. At that inauguration, everybody had to bow to that image. When the music played, everybody had to bow. And if somebody didn't bow, they were promptly dispatched. This guy was crazy. He didn't give him off. He didn't give them extra taxes. No, he just killed them. Boom. Gone. You bow or you go. And isn't that a picture of the world system today? We are supposed to dance to their music. Whatever they say goes. They change the rules, we must obey. They change mor moral codes, we must obey. We must be tolerant. We must, you know, not go against it. It is so, so, so much like it. They want everyone to do it. And much pressure is put, uh, look, everybody must do it, but those in authority have extra pressure. And that's why you find a lot of these things start in, in universities, in political cir circles. That's where a lot of this pressure comes from. There is academic pressure to conform to liberal ideas. There is political pressure to change laws and systems so they go against the will of God. There has always been opposition to the gospel. This is historic from the first century. There has always been opposition to the gospel. But in the Western world, the uh, Judeo-Christian system of law and ethics was accepted as normal. After many centuries of battle, eventually it was established. The Christian worldview was established in many Christianized nations. And it became normal. But look what's happening today. It's all changing. In so-called Christian nations, this whole thing is coming apart. Hmm? Christian values and worldviews are being challenged by the world system. And those who are not bowing down to them, to those systems, are having to what? Face the heat. The heat of opposition. The heat of persecution. The heat of unfair treatment. And the list goes on. Some of them are having to face the heat of death even today. Okay? Now, these three men would not bow to the image that the king made. And that, of course, triggered the king's fury. As we've seen already, this guy has a short temper. You know, he just loses it. It triggered the king's fury. He called him and told him to be ready to bow when the music played. 
And their answer to the king is astounding. Let us read it again. Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. <laughs> if that is the case, in other words, if you're going to throw us in the fire because you're not going to bow down to your image, if that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. How do they get to say this? I mean, nothing like this has ever happened before. And they blatantly saying this, but it goes on. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Okay, but what happens if God does not deliver them from the fire? Well, they answer it as well, verse 18. But if not, if God does not save us from the fire, if not, let it be known to you, O king, <laughs> very respectful, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Wow. Straight answer, face to face, with a very furious king. Well, you remember what happened. The king blew a gasket after this. He was already mad. After this answer, he just blew a gasket. He lost it. All right? He had the furnace heated seven times more than uh, normal and had the three men thrown inside. The strong gods that threw them in the furnace, they themselves got killed by the flames of the furnace. <laughs> but when the king looked again inside the furnace, he saw not three, but four people walking inside. <laughs> four people walking inside. Somebody was with them in the fire. Jesus was with them in the fire. Walking along with them. Amen. And like we sang today, we are never alone in the fire. No matter what you go through, whether you go through fire or through water, you are never alone. These boys were not alone. Alone. There was a fourth one walking in the fire. And so the king called them out and acknowledged that there is no other God who delivers like their God. Obviously, King Nebo had forgotten about Daniel's God, which was also their God. <laughs> Okay, so he gets a little quick reminder. And so he acknowledges that no one delivers like their God. And then he forbids anyone in his kingdom from speaking evil against their God. But the man is still a bit of a lunatic because he says, if anyone speaks against the God of these boys, you shall be killed. <laughs> this man... That's the only way you know how to resolve an issue. You don't do it, you get killed. I kill you. <laughs> anyway, but not only that, he promoted those guys. Within, within the province, he gave them more promotion. These guys now get more authority and more power. And so today, what I want to do is, I want to consider what made these men have the boldness to speak like that. What is it that they had in them that enabled them to face a furious king and confidently, respectfully, calmly, quietly give them an answer as clear as that? Notice their reply to the king as they faced a major challenge to their lives. What they had in them the answer is found in their reply. Notice that when the king challenged them, when the king confronted them, the three men did not have to hold a meeting first to discuss the issue. They did not have to go and caucus first. They did not have to go and pray about it. They did not have to go and think about it. They didn't need time to consider. The minute the king spoke, they were ready with the answer. They did not have to entertain. They don't have to discuss. They did not have to argue. No. They did not have to debate. They knew what they had to do. And that is because they had determined some things which were not negotiable. 
even during challenging times. Determined means having made a firm decision and being resolved not to change it. So these men had made a firm decision sometime before in their lives, before they faced the heat. They had made some firm decisions and had decided they would never change those decisions. And so when they were confronted with a challenge, their determination answered for them. They did not have to consider or think about a church. Just about every day, you will face challenges and situations which need a response from you. Be it challenges at work, challenges with health, areas of finances, challenges with morality issues, challenges with relationships, you will feel that the heat is on and you must either bow to the situation or stand for something else. It's a constant in our lives. We need to be alert to that. And so, like those men, there are some issues in our lives which must be settled before we face the challenges. They've got to be part of us before you face the heat. There are some things which must be determined in our lives before the challenges come, before the temptations come, before the trials and tribulations come across your life. By the time that chapter 3 rolls along, these men had already settled on some things in their lives, and they were determined to live by their principles. It was that determination that gained those boys a place in history. If they were not determined, if they didn't have these determinations in their hearts, we wouldn't be talking about them today, thousands of years after the event, and learning from that. So, from the passage we read, we see three determinations that they applied in their lives in the face of challenge, which we should also apply to our lives when we are facing challenges. Whenever we face challenging times. So let's go through them quickly. Determination number one, hope and not despair. Hope and not despair. Face challenges with hope and not despair. When a situation comes along, Face it with hope and not despair. Our fleshly nature swaps these two around. When the situation comes, we first despair, and then later we might consider hope. The world tells us when something happens, the first thing you do is you panic. And then you do something about it. Uh-uh. Hope first. Hope first. Listen to them. Daniel 3.17. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. When the king said, I'm going to kill you, they didn't go, ah! No. They didn't panic. They didn't despair. They said, our God is able to deliver us. There was hope. Their first reaction to the situation is hope. Huh? Something can be done about this. Something can be done about this. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us, is able to see us through the situation, is able to give me a solution, is able to get me through this, is able to strengthen me to, to achieve whatever it is needs to be achieved, is able to resolve whatever it is. God is able. First step, hope. Our God will never leave us nor forsake us. He has a future for us and a plan for our future. We cannot allow the climate of our circumstances to determine our view of the future. A people with no hope is a defeated people. I read about a, a village in a valley. The authorities were going to build a much needed dam and this village was going to be covered by the dam. It was going to be submerged. 
the village would only be submerged much later. And the people in the village still had a good 10 to 15 years to live in that village still. However, within five years of announcing that project to the people of the village, the village looked a mess. <laughs> Nobody was painting their houses. Nobody mended broken fences. Nobody cared for their gardens. The village was a mess. And when asked why, they answered, why should we care for our houses and our homes and everything else? Why should we care if it's going to be submerged? We have no future here. And that is how many how so many people react to challenges. Hopelessness. We have no future. And so just, just drop everything. Let everything go. They had no hope for the future. So they had nothing to work for in that village. But as believers in an eternal loving God, we do have hope. Amen? We do have hope. And so we face challenges with hope. We, we, we sang it here this morning. Our hope has a name. And his name is? Jesus. Amen. His name is Jesus. Our hope is in Jesus. With Jesus by our side, there is always hope. Amen. Let's go to determination number two. Faith and not fear. Faith and not fear. Face challenges with faith and not fear. Verse 17 of Daniel 3. He will deliver us from your hand, O king. These are words of faith. He will deliver us from your hand, O king. And understand this. That's, this statement holds true whether they burned in the fire or not. Because what would happen if they had burned in the fire? They would be in the Lord's presence in a much better place than Babylon. But here, they are believing that something is going to happen in the natural, and God is going to deliver them. And we need to have the same kind of faith, that something is going to happen in the natural, in this world, in this life, that will change. That will take you through the situation. That will take you to the other side. Amen? This is faith speaking, because faith speaks. When you have faith, you say it. You don't keep it yourself. You say it. God is a God of faith. He could have thought the world into existence, but he didn't. He spoke the world into existence. If God, who is a God of faith, speaks, you and I, as people of faith, must speak also. Come on. When David faced Goliath, he spoke to him and said, This day, the Lord will deliver you, big boy, in my hand. <laughs> hmm? when, when, when the ship that Paul was traveling in was in trouble, was in a storm, and everyone was fearing for their lives, Paul spoke to them. And he said, Take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you. Only the ship. But nobody's going to die. Take heart. Words of faith. In the middle of a storm, in the middle of nowhere, how could he say this? Faith. Faith speaks. What challenge are you facing today? Which word of, words of faith do you need to speak? The world will tell you words of fear and of doom. But we must look beyond the circumstances to the Lord who can deliver us. Amen? And then thirdly, determination number three, the final one. Principle and not predicament. Principle and not predicament. In other words, when you face challenges, respond by principle and not predicament. What did the boy say? We do not serve your gods, verse 18, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. That's it. Finish. Clark. Predicament means a difficult, unpleasant, or embarrassing situation. 
And now and then we find ourselves in a predicament, okay? Either by our own doing or because somebody else puts us in that position. It is a situation you find yourself in at a given moment. And notice the reply, in spite of the situation. They're facing this predicament, and they say, but if not, let it be known to your king. We will not bow to your image. We do not serve your gods. Sorry, full stop. And we will not bow to your image. <laughs> How often are we tempted to respond according to the predicament, according to the situation, instead of according to the knowledge of the will of God? Think about it, church. It is so easy, so much easier. Remember Joseph and Potiphar's wife? Imagine if he had responded according to his predicament. He's a slave. She's the master. Slaves obey the masters, right? So if the master wants to have some fun with you, you simply oblige. And there is peace in the camp. Not him. He could have saved himself a lot of trouble and suffering in prison if he had just said yes to the predicament. But no, he was a man of principle. He stood by his principle and he suffered for it. However, <laughs> if he had responded to the predicament, Joseph would just have died as a slave. But because he was a man of principle, he died as the prince of Egypt. Same thing with these three men. They could have given a, just a, a quick bow to the image. Just a, you know, tip your head to the image. And move on. Save your life. Keep the king, you know, at peace, at ease. Because his, short, his, fuse, his fuse is short, you know. They could have given a quick bow and, and moved on with their lives. What's the big deal? But they were men of principle. What is a principle? A principle is a predetermined decision. It is a decision I take before the challenge or temptation arises. So that when it does, I already have the answer. How many principles do you have in your life? Or do you just go with the flow? Eh? As a matter of principle, I will not cheat on my wife. It's a matter of principle. As a matter of principle, I will not steal from anyone. Feel free to forget your wallet in my car. I will not take your money. I will find you and give it back to you. It's just not in my nature. Because of a principle which I've applied. Now, the sinful nature is there, and the temptation is there. But you see, the principle override the temptation when it's a principle in your life. What did these boys base their principle on? On the word of God. Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 to 6. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. That's why in Christian churches we don't have images. We don't bow down to images. Not even images of the Lord or of the apostles or of Mary or anything like that. We are not supposed to do that. These boys knew that. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Don't think that God is a glorified Father Christmas in heaven which just gives you gifts all the time. God is love, but he's also justice. God himself is a God of principle. And he does not tolerate sin. Huh? He's a jealous God. He wants to be worshipped alone. Because after all, he is the only God. All this other stuff you see around calling himself gods are all fakes. Copies of the original. Jealous. 
That's the principle. And so these guys refuse to worship in keeping with the first and second commandments, which, just, which I've just read to you. What do you base your principles on? On popular opinion? On fame and fortune? On comfort zone? On being accepted and popular? Or is it in the Word of God, the Bible? Hmm? Because they lived by principle and not by predicament. They were ready to answer the king. Took them no time. And it was not what the king wanted to hear. That answer could have cost them their lives. And they were prepared to pay with their lives for their principles and their beliefs and their determinations. They'd rather die than compromise their faith and the principles and values they believed in. So, how do we face life during challenging times? How do you face life during challenging times? And I hope that you will face with these three determinations. If you're not doing so yet, that you'll make a note of this and face life with these three determinations. We will face challenges with hope and not despair. We will face challenges with faith and not fear. We will face challenges and respond by principle and not predicament. Is it easy? No, it's not. Because it could cost you your life. In other instances of the Bible, it did cost their lives. Is it easy? No. Is it possible? Yes. Why? Because you are not alone. God has given us the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth, to strengthen us, to give us grace when we need grace to face these challenges. But it's a grace that you will never know until you face the challenge. There are certain things in your life, there are certain graces that God will empower you with only when you are there, only when you are in the fire, the grace is there. Jesus didn't accompany them as they walked to the furnace. Three men went to the furnace, not four. But in the fire, the fourth man appeared. Because the grace of God will appear in your fire, in your situation, when you are there. So don't try thinking, oh, I wonder if I'll be able to do it, if I'll cope. Just trust the Lord and live by principle, live by faith, live by hope. And when you hit the fire, the grace will be there to take you through it. I've seen this in my own life, you and I, as we have faced a number of situations. Beforehand, we could never imagine that we could go through some of those situations. But when we were there, the mantle of anointing was there. The grace was there. The ability was there. The peace was there. The guidance was there. The faith was there. It wasn't there before, but it was there when we hit the fire. The same God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is alive today and willing to assist those who call on him. So how are you going to face your challenges? Are you slipping into the spear? Are you being paralyzed by fear? Are you torn by a decision that you have to make today? The Lord is present to touch your life, give you strength and direction. And so as you take communion now, if you are facing challenges, bring them to the Lord. I'm going to ask the ushers, please, to start distributing the communion sets while I close this message, while I carry on. And those of you online, please get your, have your bread and your juice uh, ready. You see, folks, communion, apart from us remembering what Jesus has done for us, it's also a time of reflection, time of reflection. And so I'd like us to spend this time of communion now with a bit of reflection, all right? As you take communion today, ask yourself, is there hope or despair? In my life. I need one as well, please. Let him bring one today. Thank you, brother. Is there a hope or despair in my life? Ask yourself that question. And allow yourself to answer. Respond to what is inside you. If there is despair instead of hope, you need to acknowledge that. And pray. And pour your heart to the Lord. 
You can do it here right now. You might need to take some time this afternoon and carry on in the Lord's presence processing this. Pour your heart to the Lord. Tell Him about your despair. Tell Him about the despair that you feel. Tell Him that you are going to give this despair to Him. Now you might say, but the Lord knows what I'm going through. Say it anyway. There is, a, there is healing in you acknowledging, facing your own despair, and saying it to the Lord in prayer. There, there, there is a, a holy moment. There is a connection. There is a space that is, space that is created when you are before the Lord and you say those things. You, you expose your heart's feelings to the Lord in prayer. And then tell him you are giving him your despair. And then ask him to fill your heart with hope. And then Allow his presence to fool you. Ask yourself, is there faith or fear in my heart? Today, right now, is there faith or fear in my heart? If fear fills your heart this morning, take it to the Lord. I remind you of what the Bible says, that there is no fear in love. And that perfect love, which is God, casts out all fear. I remind you that the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Confess your fear to Him and ask Him to fill you with His love. Amen. The flow of his love in your heart will break the power of fear. Ask yourself, do I tend to respond by principle or by predicament? Do I stand for I believe or do I compromise to avoid embarrassment, to stay in my comfort zone and to be accepted and popular? It's a real issue with many Christians today. So answer this question honestly. Do I tend to respond by principle or by predicament? Today is a good time to make a decision to live by principles based on the word and the will of God. Amen? And it's a good time to take that before the Lord as well. So I'm going to ask you to stand together with me. And before we take the bread, just take a moment to pray quietly and reflect on these questions, and then we will take communion. Father, as your people come before you in prayer today, Lord God, right now and maybe even as some of them continue in prayer later on today or during this week, I pray, Father, that where there is despair, you might bring the light of hope, my God. I pray, Father, that where there is fear, that faith will rise, my God, as your love floods each person's heart, breaking away the spirit of fear and allowing faith to rise in their hearts. Father, where some may be responding by predicament, rather than principle. Father, today, bring a conviction from your Holy Spirit, Lord, and empower each one to respond by principles based on your word, Lord. Even though it might be hard, even though it might cause us to face even more heat, but we know, Lord, that we are not alone in the fire. 
So help us, Lord God. Help everyone, and particularly those who are struggling with this area, Lord, to learn to respond by principle. Hallelujah. Let's take our bread. And Lord, we thank you, Father, for the fruit of the ground, this bread which reminds us of the broken body of Jesus. He faced the heat in so many ways, Lord, so that he could take upon himself all our sins. And our diseases, our spiritual diseases and physical diseases, so that we may be free today and have a relationship with you, O oh God. So, Lord Jesus, we remember your sacrifice on that cross. And we thank you, Lord, that because of that, today we can have hope. Hallelujah. It's take and eat in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for the fruit of the vine, which reminds us of the blood of Jesus poured for us to completely take away our sins, Lord, so that today we can stand before you justified, Lord. We can stand before you as your children, Lord. And so because of that, Lord, remind us today as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus. That hope has a name. His name is Jesus. That we can have true faith in a true God. Because of the love you have shown us, my God. And so help us to honor you and honor this sacrifice. By choosing to live by godly principles on this earth, Lord. And not to be molded by society. Help us not to dance according to the music of this world's system, Lord. Help us not to bow down to the images that this world creates around us. But to rather serve you and you alone, my God. Thank you for your sacrifice, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Take and drink. Be blessed as you do. Thank you, my God. Thank you, my God. We thank you, Father, for this time that we have spent together. But you know, Lord, as we depart and go to our different destinations, that you, we are not alone. You are with us. Help us to continue in this fellowship with you. Help us to continue processing this message and, 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 and being aware of these determinations and making these determinations clear in our lives, Lord, so we may, so we may bring glory to your name and experience your goodness, even in times of battle, my God, that we may know your presence with us. So now may the love of God the Father, the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with each one of you as you go forth this week in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. As you live by these three determinations, may you be victorious. Amen. As you face any fiery furnace and any challenge. The Lord bless you. Amen.